Please welcome back Bjorn Runga, joined by Jane Anderson and Glenn Close. edge my chair around a little bit so I can see all of you. So is there a Nobel Prize for acting? <laughs> Congratulations to all of you on this really wonderful work and I have to say how wonderful it uh, is to have all three of you here because we kind of get this uh, this, you know, the, tr the pipeline of creativity that went into this film with your presence here. Um, I want to ask a question for all of you, perhaps, to begin with. Um, the title, The Wife, might seem sort of fairly innocuous, but I have a feeling that maybe it presses some buttons for some people. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? I'm going to start with so, you, Jane. Oh, so you <laughs> want to go to the history? Well, actually, yeah. Am I on? Yeah, um, you're on. First, we should give credit to the novelist Meg Wallitzer, yeah. who wrote the original. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I always urge people to read the book after they've seen the film, and, and the film really has diverged a little bit. Well, has, have anyone, has anyone here read the book? Yeah. One person. Okay, a lot of you have a lot, a lot of great stuff to look forward to, right? Yeah, she's a, <laughs> a good read to look forward to. Um, but I, um, 14 years ago, um, I read the novel and I fell in love with it. And, and from there, it took 14 years to make this. Mm -hmm. That was back in 2004. And in American film production, no one at the time wanted to produce and put money into a film called The Wife as opposed to The Husband. <laughs> and it, because the main protagonist was female back then, we had to go to uh, get, I, I think you saw all the credits for all the, the, the money that was put in, that's all yeah. foreign money. You know, Swedish and, and British and Swiss, because we finally went to Bjorn, who is a sensitive Swedish man who understands <laughs> that it's okay to have a feature film about a woman and her struggle. Yeah. So in 2004, when you first wrote the screenplay, you were getting a lot of pushback. Yes. So Bjorn, how was this when you were casting for the part of, I'm going to say, the husband, how hard was that? To cast uh, Jonathan Price? You yes. Uh, it was very easy because he's such a good actor. And he's also based in the theater world. He's a very right. good theater actor. Yeah, but he's not American. No, he's not American. <laughs> and that's another discussion that I can take. Take, but I was, uh, I think, Jonathan Price was. He read the script, and he. We were talking uh, together in London. We had a meeting in London, and during that meeting, he was giving me his emotional ticket into the screenplay. Yeah. Things that was very important for him when he read the script, his reactions, and suddenly we just said, we must do this together. And uh, so I think it was, he said yes, and he was absolutely brilliant in yeah. this role. Yeah, <coughs> yeah it's, a great, it's a great combination, yeah. Um, so this film was, was uh, written in, two th I think the, the novel came out in 2003, 2004. It's set in the 90s. So for each of you, when you were beginning to work on this, how much, I mean, set in the 90s, but also flashing back to the, you know, the 50s and 60s, did you look at this as a period piece in any way? That's a great <laughs> question. I never thought of it. No, I mean, uh, knee-jerk reaction, no. Right. 
Because it's sort of Not within it's within memory, right? The, o the only thing that's period about it is that it was pre in 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 her in the flashback scenes. It was pre feminism, right? And I think that's yeah. very very important for the character. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? A little bit more about that? I mean, it's in terms of the way that. I mean, I guess what I'm seeing is this, and, and partly from what you were saying, Jane, about um, getting the film made in the first place, um, there's been a lot that has changed in the last 14 years, um, and especially in the last few years, that has shifted the way that we look at things. I mean, do you think that these characters would be different if they were existing today? Well, if you ask Meg Wolitzer, oh, right. uh, um, who's um, made a career as a female novelist. Um, she wrote a really interesting editorial in the New York Times Book Review a couple of uh, years ago um, that her novels, even though she is really one of the great prose writers, she said that her novels are usually put on the shelf of female feminist writers and that she was not ever regarded on the same level as a Jonathan Franzen. Right. Um, even though uh, her skill level, her prose, her themes are really vast and, and brilliant, yeah. it's starting to change now. Yeah. In fact, her most recent novel, um, the, uh, what's her most recent novel? The Female Persuasion, the Female Persuasion thank you. Um, has now been uh, regarded by critics as on the level of a great male novelist. And <laughs> so, okay. so, so, and so ironically, the female persuasion is about feminism. So yeah. times they are a changing, yes? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I think one of the most striking things about this is that the main character, Joan, um, is a woman, a, the, the way that she's written as a character has a lot of subtlety in it. And it's very rare that we see a female character driving a story who is, you know, as she describes herself as shy. Could the three of you talk about that a little bit from the perspective of how you, how you built that? I mean, how do you create something of interest from somebody who is retiring. I'm in life a shy person, believe it or not. <laughs> so I can relate to that. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, what I can also relate that even though I have an innate shyness, I feel passionate about my uh, chosen profession yeah. and my craft. And I think Joan, for Joan, uh, being able to write was the most important thing. Yeah. She was a born writer. Yeah. And I think um, she becomes complicit in, in, in their, in, what is the, the word for it, in how, their, in, in how her work uh, was perceived. Um, uh, but it's her choice. She's more interested in in writing than she is in the uh, public, you know. Uh, mm, yeah. Until, for me, it was um, when she actually hears. I mean, all these things are brewing, 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 because he's started to actually believe um, a lie. <laughs> um, but. Uh, when she, for me, when she actually hears at the at the ceremony how her work is perceived in the world, mm. um, that's when whatever's been brewing finally cracks. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too because I think one of the things that the film examines is the relationship of creativity and celebrity. And it's like, you know, we're living in an age where you kind of have to be both in order to have your work really seen. Um, but the other thing that's incredibly striking is um, the way that 
you and the younger iteration of this character, Joan, work together. I mean, it's, I, I don't know whether you'd like to talk about that, perhaps a little Bjorn, from the directing point of view, about how you approached um, having the younger version of this character work. Was it, a, was it a physical approach? Was it an emotional approach? I mean, what did you do to get them working together? And did they know each other? Yeah, and did they know each other? <laughs> uh, now it was, we follow the script, and we of course was thinking of what's going from, because for me the flashbacks with the mm. younger couple, that's a couple that wants to create life. It's a force into the future. And the major couple is a couple that reflecting the same life. Mm. And they mirror what they have come to be in the end of their lives. Uh, so for me, it was two different forces. Yeah. And that was a freedom for all of us. But at the same time, uh, there was details that was important for, because we shot the young couple first. Mm -hmm. And then uh, th when we have done all their scenes, we started with the first scene with the major couple in the bed mm -hmm. that uh, is uh, in the... Hello, I'm Glenn. I'm Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's jump into bed yeah. together. <laughs> so, so, so we... I know... I, I know ex <laughs> Can I just ask why you chose to do that one first with them? <laughs> it's, it's a good way to start, I think. Yeah. <laughs> now, but at the same time, I remember I tell, told uh, Jonathan that... Um, Harry Lloyd, that plays the younger yeah. Yusuf. Uh, I, I told Jonathan that uh, Harry, he has some explosive temper in some scenes. Mm, yeah. And he catched that up immediately. Mm. That's why he has that temper here and there in the major scenes. So I think uh, the important details were transformed into the major couple. Yeah. Yeah. So you were working with the younger couple first. So um, the other couple were working off of the physicality and the emotional sensibility of the younger couple. Is that right? Yeah. yeah in one well, it also helps that young Joan is Glenn's daughter. Well, there is that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Annie. Wonderful Did you realize Annie. that? Yeah. So they. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I didn't realize that until today. I, no, right. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, yeah. Um, earlier on we were talking about moments and some of the moments that were really uh, just beautiful and insightful. Do, could each of you just mention one of your favorite moments in this film that gave some insight into character or story? Well, <clears throat> when I went into this, um, my fear was that every woman in the audience who watched it would leap up and say, just leave him. <laughs> and so I had to answer for myself why she didn't. And in the week that we spent around the table, the three of us, um, we, I was able to answer that question for myself. Um, what was your question? <laughs> totally. <laughs> No, that's a, that's a great answer. I had some great Let me find a question to go with. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, now, I was asking about moments. I was thinking about oh, the moment that you mentioned with the dress. Yeah. Um, I, have some very, I have some favorite moments. Um, the scene where, when we're arriving in Stockholm, and I'm, sit, I'm just standing in the background holding his coat. Yeah. I loved that scene. <laughs> and I also loved the scene where they've had this terrible fight. And she says, I just want to get out of this dress. Mm -hmm. And she turns around, and he starts helping her unzip it. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's indicative of the complexity of this relationship and why she hasn't left him. Because underneath everything, there is this love that they've had, which has gotten very burdened and very complicated. Um, but I felt incredibly real. And um, so those are kind of some of my f 
my favorite. It moments. is a beautiful I moment. I mean, it's almost like a you know a snapshot of a marriage in that one action. Yeah. How about I you? can remember there was one moment, one of the last day in Glasgow, because we shot mainly the film in Glasgow, and we took the scene, the death scene, mm -hmm. and there was a shot on you when you go to the window, and we were improvising in one way because it was a move with the camera and it was a focus pulling and it was a light shifting and it, it was three Scottish men that bringing down the snow outside the window. <laughs> so it was so many things that should be right on the spot. And we did the three takes, but there wasn't, we didn't get it. And the th third take, and we had been a long day, and you said to me, I can't do it anymore now. I'm exhausted. I can't do it. You disappeared. And I understand you f completely. And we said to each other, me and the photographer and the team, okay, we have to cut this together in one way. So we started to do some insert here and there. And suddenly someone was knocking on my shoulder. And there you stood. And everyone went silent. And we go back with the camera. And then we take the last one, and that's, that's in the film. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that was the memory for me. For that scene film. was so, so difficult for me. Really? Well, to have that huge fight, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then he has a heart attack, and he's dying. And he says to me, do you love me? <laughs> As I literally was speechless. Yeah. And I remember stopping and saying, do I have to say this one? <laughs> I, don't know how, I don't know how to do it. How unfair. <laughs> it was such a complicated moment. But of course, the right thing is that she says yes. I mean, what are you going to say? Um, because she actually and then did love him, but it was a good liar. <laughs> oh, I know. And then he says, you're such a good liar. How will I ever know that? And it's like, and then he dies. <laughs> That was really hard, and I, I think the difficulty that I felt was the difficulty that the character was feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you say? Mm -hmm. To be honest, you would say, I'm not sure, <laughs> but he's dying, so you say, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the job of a script writer, to write things that are really hard to act. <laughs> <laughs> I That's love that the job. <laughs> and to direct and to figure out. So, okay, so I was asking about moments. So when you were writing the screenplay, were there any uh, moments where perhaps you were looking at something in the novel that you wanted to create into something that was cinematic or like an emotional moment or something like that that would stand out for you in the writing process? Um, Many things. Um, for instance, in the novel, the prize is a Helsinki prize, which right. doesn't have, and I thought, let's make it the Nobel Prize, to, because um, when you're translating a novel to film or, or doing any kind of script, you want to keep upping the stakes, so you're just sticking it in the characters, and the Nobel is so grand. Also, I uh, started doing research on the Nobel, and when I found out that they did that ridiculous thing of bringing in a girl with candles on her head <laughs> to wake up, the, I, I read about that, I thought, that's fabulous. <laughs> um, and there is one thing I regret got cut from the film which is when Joan gets up to get out of the bed. I wrote that she, you see her peeing in the bathroom and she's singing to herself in the same tune, Joe Castleman, you know, and, he, and she's just, you know, what a great man, you know, and it, it's just kind of a lovely, bitter moment, but I think you didn't want to pee on film. Oh, I didn't I, care. I, think, no, yeah. We, yeah, yeah. I can tell you the truth. We shot it. Yeah. But suddenly something, some tension was disappearing. 
So I, I'm so sorry. We cut it out, but... <laughs> we did shoot it? Yeah, we shot okay. it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> two, two different takes. Uh, yes, there's just so many ways you can pee. Yeah. <laughs> but the main challenge of the novel, it's a, if any of you read it, it's a delicious, pissed-off read because it's, to it's told the, through Joan's point of view. And Meg is such a wonderful, caustic writer. And the character of Joan in the novel is just so angry at the beginning. And because as a novelist, the prose is just so much fun to read, um, her anger is delicious. But I knew that if I wrote a protagonist who was furious from the very beginning, and that Joe was such an asshole from the very beginning, a film-going audience would, in a way, turn off to the experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. And making Joe and the, the relationship a more um, uh, sympathetic was important because if you see a, a dignified woman married to a horrible man, you think this woman is deeply flawed. And what Glenn and Jonathan and Bjorn did so beautifully mm -hmm. during the filming was to find those moments of affection and sexuality and tenderness that explained why this woman would stay in this situation. And I, I don't know if any of you remembered, um, a few years ago there was the film Short Eyes, which was about the woman who did the Keen paintings mm -hmm. and a horrible husband. And, it, and we didn't want to repeat that. This isn't a film about a woman being oppressed by a bad man. This is a film about a marriage and the agreements we make in a marriage mm. that work for a while until they don't. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. So I hope no one gets divorced after tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then one other thing you did with the uh, adaption from the novel. You bring up the character, the David character, much more than in the novel. And I thought that was genial, yeah. absolutely. So we have some mic runners in the audience, and I'd love us to take some questions from the audience. So do um, you want to go first, Dave? Uh, do some talk. <laughs> and this is by no means speaking to the, the, mov the movie was terrific. All of you, it's so fantastic. But I also wondered if there are any plans to take it to the stage. Oh. Well, all of you have stage backgrounds as well, right? I'll let uh, Jane have to answer that. <laughs> I think it's complete enough as it is. That, that's a lovely idea, but um, no, it's, we completed it. We have other plays to do. We, yes, I'm doing a new play by Jane this fall at the public. Yeah. And it's called? It, well, it's called Mother of the Maid, and Glenn is going to be playing Joan of Arc's mom. <laughs> and, and she'll be playing a peasant woman, quite the opposite. Yeah. You know, a muddy-footed, working-class, gorgeous, illiterate woman. Brave. Gorgeous yeah. is important. <laughs> <laughs> I think you must be in your Joan phase. Yes. Yeah, oh. Joan and Joan. Oh, my yes. God. I didn't think yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, let's take a question on this side. Yes. Uh, wait, 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 wait. We have a mic coming for you. Oh. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in the last remark about it being a film of female... Um, what was it? Help me. Oppression. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get it at all. I didn't get that takeaway at all. In fact, uh, I got quite the opposite. Um, is there, is there a consensus that it's a film of female uh, oppression? No, I think that's like about a marriage. 
No, Did about you say oppression? Oppression. About a, the female being oppressed. You you thought that that what, what it was about? Yeah, well, in in a in a in an earlier remark, or maybe I'm just having a a craft moment. No, I um, think I think that. I think that what you re were referencing was that it could have been a film about oppression, but actually okay. it's not. Okay, so right. I think could I think, have been yeah. good because I thought there was a great payoff between both characters. Yeah, it was a very strong movie. I mean, a very strong film to that end. Just as, just as strong the man and and the woman, husband and wife. There was a payoff for each. Yeah, and um, yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to know about that. Would you like you to, to add anything to that on the the degree of payoff? The payoff for the for, for both the wife. of the for the wife. Okay. Hmm. Well, I think she would have left him if he. I mean, he he then of course died, but I think she definitely would have left him. Um, in the beginning. <laughs> Like in the 50s and 60s? Yes. In the beginning of their relationship. <laughs> so what's... I love, uh, first of all, I love, I really get that beginning and especially the scene where he says, uh, we can't be together anymore because I'm not the talented one. Right. Mm -hmm. And she immediately says, um, no, 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 I love you, I love you, I love you, and I can fix it. Yeah. Do you want me to fix it? And he says, yes. And there we have it. Yeah. And I think she says it because she loves him, but she's also terribly afraid of losing him. And she says it to make him feel better about himself. Yeah. And she spends the rest of her life with him, making him feel better about himself, knowing uh, you know, the, the, the unspoken thing between him until he articulates it in that last fight is, I don't have the talent, you do. And the, the payoff, she's com as, as complicit as he is in, in their life together. She's allowed to, she writes, and he is the public face of it. Um, but uh, I really, I really understand. I really understand that. I think there are a lot of women who say, "I can fix it, and I can make you feel better about yourself." Mm -hmm. um, and until she can't anymore. Thank you. A question on this side. Yeah. I think the one of the wonderful moment, moments throughout the film wasn't what was spoken, Glenn, but your face reacting to what was being said, that you didn't ever have to say anything. You're a brilliant actor. And just watching your face process the background and the way the camera was just there, and you could feel it in your gut, but you never had to say a word. It's your, you were brilliant. Well. I have to say that um, I really felt I totally trusted uh, Bjorn. And I think Bjorn, and I, I hope you take this as a compliment, Bjorn is um, kind of uh, in the, in the in Mark Bergman school of filmmaking, in that he knows where to put the camera to capture what his actors are doing. And that's like basic. And he also knows where to put uh, a close-up in order to keep an audience emotionally connected. And so I felt um, incredibly well, well served. And, I, and, and you know, our, our collaboration through this um, was incredible. But I think without uh, Bjorn's trust and uh, letting us do what we do, and also Ulf, uh, uh, our our uh, our cameraman was was brilliant as well, and they they're a great team, and the way they um, uh, staged some of those those scenes, like for example, the scene that uh, Christian Slater and I had at the in the uh, in the bar, 
it, he had two cameras, one going one direction in kind of an, in a, an ellipse and the, another one going in the opposite direction. So we felt we were in a play. It was, we did the whole scene uh, every time. And so we really had a chance to play off each other. And uh, so he, he, he um, presented us and filmed us in a way that um, I don't think uh, it, the film would not be as effective without his sensitivity. I really do. Thank you. I've got time for a couple more questions on this side. So a very nice ending, Jones got her blank page. And so as creators of the character, how is she going to fill that without letting the cat out of the bag? Thoughts? I don't know. I don't know what Jane thinks. You you go first. Say that again. Well, how she she's going to write. Can she? Will she change her style so that two thirds of the world won't go? Aha! There's the real Nobelist. Ah yes. Um, and actually, in many different drafts, that was part of Joe's argument in the very last scene. You know, you'll never be able to write because you'll always sound like a Joe Castleman knockoff. I think, I think she starts, she's been writing from a male point of view. I always saw Joe Castleman like a Philip Roth and writing about, she wrote his culture, his male point of view. So now she gets to write from her point of view. And, and you saw in that last um, frame of the film, she touches the blank page. Yep, over here. Partly this is probably credit to the original writer, but I love that Joan is just a little more complete than Joe, in the name even. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I don't know, oh no, if that was intentional on her part, but it strikes me as funny. But the part I think that galled me the most, the part of the relationship, was that the son was so desperate for the father's approval, and it was really not his that was needed. And I wondered at the end if you, both the writer and, and you, Miss Close, if you felt that she was really going to tell them the whole thing, if she was really going to do it. I think absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And, and then, I mean, my, even though she would write from her point of view, I don't, you know, I, I've always thought that she, somehow the truth would come out. It was not going to come out through uh, Nathaniel Bone, that's for sure. <laughs> and that whenever it came out, it would be on her terms and, you know, taking her family into consideration. But in one way, when he asks her in the room in the fight with the three of them, uh, do you goose write dad's books? And she is beat, beat, and then, no, I don't. He knows, I think, in my opinion. Let's take one last question. Right, in the back. I, I was so impressed. Um, as, as other people have said, just watch, watching the emotions on your face, how profound and quiet it was. Um, and I'm wondering, when you go through the experience of acting out these characters, does it, does it change you in any way that you're aware of going forward in your own life? Like, do, do you feel like a fierce, uh, uh, like an additional fierceness sort of come up for the injustice of this, because of course she did also quiet her voice, not just to keep her man, but also because she'd gotten the message that there was nowhere for her to go anyway. So there was that. And, you know, or does it, do you, I can imagine you developing all kinds of layers of empathy for so many different kinds of people that it would crack your heart open in a lot of different ways. I'm just curious about that. 
not sure what the question is. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, like, how does it change you to uh, take on these other people and be them in the film? Like, what does it do to you personally? Does it, does it? I, I think, and I've actually been thinking about this. I think I've now been in this profession almost 43 years, 42 years. Um, I think I'm more aware uh, and take, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly kind of eternally curious about um, the internal life of characters, you know. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm, I would consider myself an introvert to begin with. Um, all of us introverts learn how to seem like we're not. <laughs> but definitely that. I think I exist very much in my head. And if anything, um, playing these characters put me more into the realm of thought and exploration uh, than anything else. And um, I get so excited um, by the possibility of trying to figure out the whys of behavior. Um, I'm terrified by this play that we're gonna be doing. I have no idea uh, at this point of how to, to play her, but the challenge uh, is thrilling. And, and I think I am very touched by all the characters that I've played. Um, I feel that in some ways they have given me a public persona, which is really not true. <laughs> you know, I'm not those fierce, uh, you know, I'm not Patty Hughes. I'm not the Marquise de Metoy. Um, I remember Chris Walken once telling me that when he wasn't working, he felt, he felt like a fighter uh, sitting, on, sitting in the corner. And I, and I kind of really relate to that. I think those of us who, who, who are compelled to, to try to you know, create characters that, have, that will emotionally connect in stories that have some sort of real value um, that uh, we, we, I've always thought that I was a blank page, that I was a blade of grass on shifting sand. Mm. And I think my work helps me organize myself. Um, so, uh, it's something I've, I think I've grown into and, um, I'm deeply grateful for. And we are so grateful for you all for being here tonight. Thank you so much for this beautiful work. The film will open at the Rafael in late August, and then the play will be opening at the public in the o end. October? October, yes. October. okay. Yes. So September. Plan, plan your trips to New York. September, it opens in September. September. Previews. Thank you for you, were here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I thought we, we saw that.